Good morning. Uh, welcome to this session uh, dedicated to discussing and addressing the key challenges related to the working condition um, in the performing arts. I'm really happy to be here with you today in the context of this great European Theatre Forum to address such an important issue. Um, it is and has always been, of course, a major issue for the artists and the cultural professionals working in the sector. Um, every aspect um, re in re related to the working condition, how to enter this very attractive field, how to make a living of my art, how to combine personal and professional life. And uh, of course, as we go through unprecedented crisis uh, that impacts so violently the performing arts sectors across Europe and the world, how to survive uh, the current crisis. So as mentioned in the uh, introductory text to this session, the cultural and creative sectors have been increasingly recognized at the EU level in the past years for their significant contribution to the various fields of social life, economic development and international relations. And today amidst the COVID crisis, it is a high moment to acknowledge that the vitality and sustainability of cultural and creative sectors stems from the well-being the freedom and the integrity of the people uh, professionally engaged in artistic and cultural activity. As we know, support measures have been taken by, by various member states amidst the pandemic um, and national legal structures protecting the status of cultural professionals exist in some countries, but they do vary widely from country to country. And, and um, the current situation um, runs the risk of creating even bigger gaps between the European performing arts ecosystem and to undermine the potential uh, for cross-border collaboration further in the months and years to come. Therefore, we believe it was a very high moment to um, discuss the issue uh, at European level and also to explore um, the possibilities of a new action on working conditions of artists and, and cultural professionals. So this is uh, what this session is about and I've been asked uh, to guide you through it. Um, my name is Daphne Tepper and I work for UNIME, the division of Uni Europa representing workers in the media, entertainment and art sectors, mostly uh, the professionals working behind the stages and set. This uh, session will last two hours and uh, it will be organized in three key moments. First, we will hear from artists and cultural workers on their experiences on the ground. Then we will uh, exchange with a professional organization in order to understand and highlight the main challenges and issues relating uh, to the working conditions in the performing arts sector. And finally, we will exchange with uh, EU policymakers and member states representatives on the possibilities of uh, EU level actions. So first, uh, let's hear from the professionals and let's play the video. The main uh, ob Hello, my name is Angela Ferenda. I work with uh, Club Gein Roni in Groningen, the Netherlands. Hi. I'm Ingrid Franke. I'm an artist and dramaturg living in Brussels and working in Belgium and abroad. 
Hello, my name is Florentina Horzinger and I'm an Austrian choreographer based in Vienna. Hello, my name is Sanna and I work as a wardrobe manager on Skånes Dance Theatre in Malmö, Sweden. Hello, my name is Konrad Michalak and I'm an actor. I work in a public municipal theatre in Wuch, which is the third most populated city in Poland. So the main uh, obstacle for me as a cultural worker uh, and the thing that I find most difficult uh, with working as I do is to find the balance between my work life and my personal and family life. Uh, before when I uh, worked for TV and films, uh, the main thing was that you could never find uh, employment that was longer than like a year. And you also had to travel a lot and you had to be away a lot. And if you have kids, that's always a problem. So I'm very lucky now, uh, even though there's a pandemic going on, uh, to have been able to find work at Skånes Dance Theatre. There are about 30 actors employed in my theatre, but only a few of them are lucky to be performing these days. Having a full-time job contract gives you this basic financial security. Every month you get a salary, which is usually a bit higher than the national minimum wage. For performing, you get extra paid. Before Corona, uh, you could double or even triple your basic salary with the remuneration you got for performing. Every actor used to perform six, 10, even 15 times a month. And now, we are happy if we have even one show in a month. For me, the biggest thing about this career is the fact that it is so, so bright and so short that it uh, becomes uh, quite a big um, thing to think of your life afterwards. In the Netherlands, we're fortunate enough to have a system which is called the Omscholings Fund, so that in the end of your career, if you have accumulated a certain amount of premiums, you can get, uh, access funding for your retraining or re-education for your second life, in a way, which um, is very hard to think about, especially in the beginning of your career, but then also during, because you're supposed to um, feel very passionate about another kind of life after you've spent most of your life working on even getting this career. Yeah, I would say my work was always uh, very international. I studied in Holland, I have a big community there, I have a big community that I am connected to in Berlin, in, in Switzerland, and so on. But also I think, yeah, for it's essential for the work that it is that it is pr produced internationally somehow, which always uh, has been tough, of course, because um, people need to gather at one place. So that means like accommodations need to get covered and residences need to be found all over the place. What has been difficult in my career is obviously, yeah, moving around, living out of a suitcase. Uh, it hasn't been, uh, for the past six years, I've been able to shoot roots out, um, which is quite nice and lovely. I have a dog now, which is unheard of. Um, yeah, it's not so much that I was, I was moving around because I couldn't stay at places where I worked, but it was more that I was like searching for, for a place that I could um, thrive in, like a plant. Um, and I finally found one, so I'm very fortunate about that. The thing I like about the mobility is that you need you get to satisfy your curiosity about people, about places, and you meet so much uh, fun and amazing people when you're away. Uh, and they can also come to us, so that's uh, even more amazing that I can still meet them, but I don't have to go away as much. The main challenges I face in my work are combining several jobs with different levels of involvement and different timelines. In order to survive as a self-employed artist, you can count that I 
always have five to seven work engagements running simultaneously. This can go from teaching to working on my own projects, working as a dramaturg for others, writing jobs and smaller invitations, just as this one. Due to the COVID pandemic, this problem actually got worse because next to taking on the jobs and estimating whether or not I can combine them, there is now an added element of speculation. Will this job actually happen? In the past, getting a full-time job contract in the theater was one of the main goals of fresh graduates. Nowadays, young actors prefer to be freelancers, which gives them more freedom. Most of them migrate to Warsaw, where they compete with other freelancer and non-freelancer actors, younger and older, for the roles in theaters, TV, film, commercials, dubbing, etc. When the corona stroke, all the freelancers immediately lost all of their income. They woke up not knowing what the upcoming months will bring them. All the film sets were cancelled, the rehearsals were suspended. Of course, we received a little help from the government, but we don't know what is going to be in the next month. So Corona hit us, of course, really hard. We had just been in the middle of a very busy touring schedule of my show Tanz. Um, plus, we had just premiered a week before the lockdown another show um, that was chopped off right away. In total, we, we kind of had a loss throughout the summer of 40 shows in total and yeah, a complete um, break in our income. Because, of course, the summer period is usually really our most busy touring period. It's where all of the summer festivals happen. Of course, a part of these of these um, festivals and of these performances, like they got officially postponed, so we didn't see much money there, like com as in compensations. Postponed to autumns, postponed to two twenty one, even to two twenty two. So there is not that much that we get from that. Plus, uh, there is a bit of a hope that it will happen in the future. We have not had to cancel any performances yet. Uh, of course, that is still on debate, but we have two more stage performances left of our latest piece uh, that we are doing on Malmö Opera uh, on the big stage. Uh, and we're performing for 50 people that is placed throughout the seating area uh, with large amount of space uh, in between. So it feels safe uh, and it's uh, safe for dancers and our company has been um, very good at informing everyone about uh, the situation and how we can handle everything. So the whole company was tested and if you have symptoms, you stay at home uh, and you do a test and you can't come back to work uh, until you have received answers on your test. And if the test is negative, then you stay at home until you've been well for 48 hours. Uh, and um, then you can come back to work. Uh, but if the tests were positive, we haven't, fingers crossed, uh, not had any positive results on in our company yet, uh, then everyone has that has been in contact with a person needs to stay at home and they need to do a test and they need to do another test within the incubation time. Uh, so I think that the company has very good strategies for how we would handle a positive result within our within the company. Uh, and I think that everyone is taking very good care of themselves and being respectful to others. I'm on a contract. I used to be a freelancer, uh, also not only around Europe, but around the world. And I'm very grateful to have a contract now uh, because it comes with a lot more um, safety, especially in these weird times of um, on and off lockdowns. Uh, we are incredibly fortunate to have uh, devised a show that can still um, run through a partial lockdown, so we don't have more than 30 people visiting the show at a time. And I'm filming right now in the venue where we are about to perform a premiere tomorrow. Uh, Corona has been difficult. We have um, devised an online platform for our work um, so all the smart heads got together and we uh, we designed a, 
a website called uh, nighthotel.org where uh, we can keep on presenting our work also in the future and I think this will continue even post-COVID eventually. Um, it's just kind of the sign of the times to move things online or to think of of your work in online aspects as well as in person which is such a um, apparent part of a, a, a dance career which is live performance everybody was kind of really depending on their individual emergency funding in their countries which um yeah i have a, a, a cast from uk i've cast from portugal from germany from netherlands from belgium from holland uh, from from switzerland from all kinds of places really and we could really compare how individual countries treat their artists and some of us they just didn't get nothing they just got like governments that told them to change their job finally <laughs> so um yeah we that was tricky that was tricky for for a lot of us and we started touring again slowly in august uh, with like venues um, like some of festival in camp Nagel that could afford to really quarantine us for a decent period of time and afford all of the testing to comply to the regulations and so on. Uh, yeah, so we could count on our fingers the venues that could do stuff like this because, um, yeah, at the moment we really want to get tested everywhere. And yeah, not a lot of venues are experienced in doing this in a proper way, I would say. <laughs> Um, but we did have shows in Holland in September and also in Switzerland. And we are preparing to have shows now in Belgium in two weeks. But it's a little bit of a gamble. I mean, right now it gets harder and harder again to, to cross borders. So already uh, in the last month, it was always a little bit of a, a praying that everybody gets over, over borders. So this is where I have my performance tonight. The capacity of this venue is about 400 seats. Due to the government regulations, we are only allowed to let 25% in, which is about 100 spectators. But the show tonight sold only 50 tickets. Why? Firstly, because people are afraid to go out. Secondly, because many shows get cancelled and people are never sure if the performance is going to happen. So usually they buy the tickets just before they go to the show. And why are the performances cancelled? Because two little tickets are sold in advance and it becomes unprofitable. So do you see this vicious circle that we're in? Welcome back. Um, thank you so much uh, to Sana, Angela, Florentina, Conrad and Ingrid for their insight. I think so much was said already and uh, so much was said from the people really going through this reality. So I'm really grateful to have their voices with us today as it set the tone um, for our session, I believe. So um, before we continue the discussion, let me inform you that uh, through this session, those watching in Zoom are invited uh, to send their questions to the speakers using the Q&A box. And those watching the live stream can type their questions in the chat and the forum team will pass them on to me. So we will take your questions after a first round of uh, exchange with our next panelists. So uh, let's start the second sequence of our um, of our session we'll start with a uh, with Morton good morning Morton um, you are the managing director of uh, NTO the Association of Norwegian theaters and orchestras uh, which members include the major Norwegian public funded theaters orchestras operas dance companies and, and music ensembles you are also the current president of Pearl the European Trade Federation of Performing Arts Organization. So thank you very much for being with us today. And I'd like to, to start with a question. A lot was said by uh, the colleague just now, but can you highlight for us some of the specific features of the sector and their impact on employment patterns? Oh, good morning, Europe. 
um, from a, from a grade day in Norway? Yeah, well, big question. Uh, as a big, big question, but but uh, uh, but I'll take for granted that we have a professional audience out there that we are that people from the business from the branch we know we talk about and of course then then the EC the short version it's it's complex it's innovative it's diverse and uh, so the trick is to encourage innovation and secure traditions at the same time and as we are going to talk about today secure the individuals as workers and the, and, and rights a special feature of course um, for our sector is that large parts of European cultural life has been and it still is you know, dependent on, on public financial support. It obviously makes us particularly vulnerable uh, for political change and, and for economic downturns, cyclical uh, dependence in other words, which in principle makes us also dependent on good, in the bottom of this, good protective laws and a good understanding of, of the arm's length principles, just like as, as uh, uh, as, 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 the, as the first and, and, and best pr principle. Then we are, of course, as was pointed out by this beautiful uh, opening session here, uh, a very uh, international workforce, a mobile, we are mobile travelers, disregarding maybe some, some of the language barrier for actors, the rest of us, the rest of you out there are flexible and competent to work anywhere. We are, you know, in a way, family as we very much point out in, in good times. And some of you out there travel the world and we need that, but most of us, even artists, spend uh, most of our working life locally. And let's not forget that either. That also has to be uh, taken taken into uh, account when, when we discuss working conditions. Uh, and then this uh, this wonderful word flexible. I mean, uh, we, we it's you can use it in any way. You know, we are flexible, but it's also an, uh, uh, just a nice way to say not permanent employees. Uh, the development, as you all know, in the last 30, 40 years has been towards more freelancers, of course, relatively fewer permanent employees. And there are many reasons for it, uh, which we I hope we can talk about. There are artistic pra practices, of course. I mean, the way we work, it's, and that's, uh, that's good, uh, a diverse way of producing. Uh, it's also a large increase all over Europe in educated artists, educated people in the art business, which is uh, both good and, and a challenge. Uh, the surplus of talent is obviously good, uh, but the fight for, for, for jobs is, is a challenge. And we have seen huge growth in festivals and events, and we have seen a reduction in public support, especially since the financial crisis of 2008. Um, and all in all, it's I, I, it's even without the COVID-19 situation, it's it's already a challenging, demanding situation for the social partners and the artists, and the unions and the individuals. Uh, but until we were hit by the pandemic, we were a sector in in what I would describe as exciting growth. Uh, if you are talking about cultural life in the broadest sense of the world, uh, growth in the entertainment uh, entertainment industry. But then again. Uh, for us, uh, maybe most of us listening to this today, uh, also inside that frame, there is the classic distinction between culture um, and art. Uh, and, uh, and that distinction is probably still there. And that, that is at least, you know, um, a specific feature in our business, I would say. I mean, uh, a lot of things is, is not very different from other, other branches, but this distinction between that we are in this for the art's sake. Uh, and, um, um, and and to balance that. And uh, it was mentioned there also before, but how did you witness the current crisis impact our sector? And more specifically, I think, what uh, fragilities do, do you think it highlighted, the crisis? Oh, well, it just, I mean, as, as, as a human family, how fragile we are. I mean, I, I don't think we, you know, we, we need team, time to digest this very much. I mean, the whole situation, but probably, uh, uh, and, and some of you have started on that already. Uh, of course, it highlights the political uncertainty I mentioned earlier, of course, uh, but the very way we work collectively together, physical, uh, and with them still the main, even though if, if digital content is popping up all over Europe, I mean, still with the main business idea to meet a live audience with live artists. Well, I think, I mean, uh, no other sector, I think, uh, is, is less compatible with COVID-19 in a way. I mean, we, this, this, was, this was absolutely, I mean, there, there are theaters in Norway who, who, who tell the story of they have never been for 100 years closed 
one day. I mean, the show has even even during even during wars wartime, it, it's still been doing some kind of business. So when we closed on on March 13, that was the first time. For some of our biggest theaters, it was the first time ever that they closed down closed down without it being a holiday. Um, so well, to 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 see the full impact of this, but of course we were very very vulnerable, and the, and it also shows the gaps. Uh, as we are going to discuss in, in social protection, of course, uh, from, from different countries and for different group of people. And the access to social security rights, such as unemployment benefits, um, uh, etc. And, and it shows the complex way in which people earn their money in this sector. And in many countries, we have to say, social partners have worked their socks off the last past months to behind the scene and on the scene to get things more straight and make it possible for freelancers to access these unemployment structures and other benefits. Um, some has succeeded good in that, some has not, uh, which is a European problem. Uh, the mobility is, of course, reduced. The access to the world market uh, has gone and collapsed and forced us into to, 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 to looking at the local markets, neighboring countries, digital products. Um, so in other words, options for projects and employment opportunities have shrunk, of course. Um, and well, and it's it too early to say, of course, uh, how many will leave the sector. Um, but but a recent study in, in Norway, even though we here have good support systems in in place, also for the for the freelancers, uh, figures show that as much as twenty percent of the people asked were th thinking about leaving or changing changing um, career or over to other sectors. Um, starting with that. Thank you, Martin. It's interesting what you say about initiatives coming up through social dialogue and others to, to help, especially the freelancers. We'll get back to it in a second round, if you agree. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, I wanted to continue with Ulrike, Ulrike Kühner. Hello, you are the managing director of the IG Freie Theaterarbeit and promoting the service and information tool for freelance artists at Austria. And uh, you're also the current president of the newly funded um, umbrella organization, the European Association of Independent Performing Arts. So thank you for being with us. I also have a question for you. Um, what do we know of the working conditions in the independent scene across Europe? Mm, yes, hello and uh, good morning to Europe, so to say. Uh, well, if the working conditions in the performing arts sector are precarious and unstable, they are even more so in the independent performing arts sector. Individuals working in the independent field are especially vulnerable since they often work on short-term basis with unclear statuses and without long-term funding plans, switching back and forth between different contracts. Studies in several countries show that independent artists receive an income on 20 to 22 weeks per year. The average gross income from artistic and educational work is between 15,000 and 25,000 euros, uh, 25, euros per year. Usually the success rate to get public funding for an artistic project is between 15 to 20 percent which means this shows how fragile the, stru uh, the entire structure is and how fragile the entire income structure, not in a normal year and not attacked by COVID, for example, is. The COVID-19 cri uh, crisis has merely amplified these shortcomings and brought to light the neglect society has shown towards the working conditions of the individual artists. In parallel, it also brings attention to the individual artists. Until now, politicians responsible for arts and culture primarily dealt with the organizations and institutions. For example, in Vienna, only 16% of the budget spent for the independent perform arts scene, which is a total about approximately 30 million euros, 30 million euros is dedicated to funding structures the artists can directly apply for. But it is the artists and it's the, it are the companies who develop the artistic productions and they take both the artistic as well as the economic risk. However, the field of the independent performing arts is far from being a fringe phenomenon. On the contrary, 
this scene is steadily growing with an increasing number of international engagements and employers opting for short-term or freelance instead of long-term contracts with theaters or companies. And the artist before also uh, in the videos, they highlighted this very much. This is really the, a little bit the future perspective of the artist. They want to create their own shows. They want to create their own productions and uh, they do not any longer want to become or want to be so directly dependent from a curatorial choice or from selection processes. The European Association of Independent Performing Arts founded in 2018 is the umbrella organization of associations, organizations and interest groups from all over Europe representing the independent performing arts at a national and international level. Our mission is to improve the conditions and sustainability of professional independent performing arts within our member countries, to raise visibility and awareness of independent performing arts with the sector itself and for the general public and all involved authorities. And we endeavor to create prosperity across the sector and aim to attain future sustainability in three correlative areas. It's about social sustainability, economic sustainability and ecological sustainability. In the work you've been doing in the last two years, have you been, have you identified already some good practices across Europe to, to fight this precarity and secure careers? Um, yeah, this is also what uh, the other speakers just highlighted or said to me. So uh, the fragmentation of Europe and the fragmentation um, of this several social and uh, cultural political uh, responsibilities. This is causes a big problem when it comes I mean, to work on the European level. Um, and for sure, there are many, many differences in between the different member states. Um, but the current challenges can be mentioned as fair pay and fair play, and they include all stakeholders, artists, institutions, politicians and funders. COVID now stimulated this debate and interesting wise the general audience and politicians are currently very aware that the social funding and contract that the social funding and the contract the contracting system needs to be renovated the focus is now on the people and in several countries this process of renovation already started this is also what morton just highlighted before for example, some countries like France and Belgium have established an artist status, which, which was also mentioned before, which offers individual artists and artistic companies a more profound social security system and more financial and artistic flexibility and visibility. In Sweden, for example, there is a fixed system of remuneration there is uh, for each participant within a project. In Germany and in Austria, here in Vienna right now, there is a minimum honorarium structure which recommends a fee per month or per day, which should not come below. But everything depends if the company gets public funding. And here again, we are with a 15 to 20% maximum success rate. Currently, AIPA, the European Association, has teamed up with Thomas Eder, who is associated with the theater studies department at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich for a big research, research project that aims to provide a direct overview of the organizational field of the independent performing arts in Europe. This project will create a basis for comparison concerning distinct, the national characteristics of independent performing arts infrastructures, the social statuses of the artists, the funding systems and the role of advocacy organizations. In 2018, we made a first research study and collected general data and information about the field. And the following findings there are crucial, which is first, the independent scene is a fundamental force in art and cultural production in all countries that were part of the study. It encompasses several hundred thousand professionals, tens of thousands of festivals, production venues and residency programs, representation structures on local, national and international levels, billions of audience members with media attention often reaching far beyond European borders. So still the working conditions are often poor and the field is not fully recognized by all European governments. 
some answers to fight precarity and to permanently secure the diversity and the high quality of the field were found. But however, a European-wide implementation has still not been successful. Thus, the research suggests the following recommendations to find a basis for appropriate adjustments of the funding systems and for innovative improvements of economic and so social political parameters adaptable to the needs of performing arts professionals. A comparative study is needed that further analyzes the needs and requirements of the field with regards to the funding systems and policy making processes of all countries under study. With this study attend, and we are starting right now, and the first questionnaire will be delivered uh, on 1st of December. This time we are comparing 12 countries or even more, not only using interviews with experts, but conducting an additional survey that will involve practitioners as well. Thank you, Ulrike. Very interesting work. And I think you're right, the crisis is pushing this topic on the agenda at national levels, at European levels, which is very good. Um, now, as Martin said, we have to make sure it's not too late, uh, the crisis being so violent. And um, I'm glad we have this discussion today also with policymakers because it is extremely timely. So we will move to Elena now, um, Elena Polit from um, you are head of policy and research at IETM, the International Network for Contemporary Performing Arts. And uh, I wanted to ask you how you consider the precarity affects the, the artistic and sometimes the political dimension of the work and what impact it has on the diversity and inclusivity of the sector. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, the precarious conditions in which um, artists operate uh, for them to use all their creativity, agility and flexibility to adapt to the hard realities and to invent their own solutions to deal with them. And this is often called resilience. But over focus on resilience, um, as we can imagine, for the serious problems on the long term for freedom, integrity and autonomy of the artistic work itself. Um, artist resilience, and not only in time of crisis, often means um, tricking uh, the precarity with um, most innovative solutions, uh, su survival strategies, and juggling among several jobs, not necessarily artistic ones, uh, with scattered projects and going for hectic mobility. And this has an impact on the ability of artists and, and creative workers to pursue and to shape a sustainable long-term uh, professional trajectory, which would be based first of all on their artistic values, but also on their social and political values. Basically the constant effort to adapt to the hard realities and to precarious socioeconomic conditions in the sector uh, puts enormous pressure on the artistic value of what artists are doing. Um, in some periods of time, um, it can it, uh, even undermine artists' ability to work at all, to create and to express themselves. And this often comes um, with economic instrumentalization of the arts, uh, with harsh competition within the sector, trying to fit into too many different uh, priorities of too many different funding programs and self-censorship. This is undermining creativity, critical thinking, and freedom of expression. And by the end of the day, our societies are losing out on the most innovative and impactful artistic work. Precarity is also, of course, a very negative factor for the diversity, inclusivity, and um, equality in the workforce in the performing arts. There are no statistics at the EU level about how European performing arts are doing in terms of um, diversity and inclusivity, but some national research suggests that um, professionals from lower socioeconomic uh, backgrounds are heavily underrepresented in theaters, venues, um, festivals, and art organizations of all types. And socioeconomic fragility um, is often connected to such as um, gender, race, uh, physical ability, etc. Minority groups in our sector are either taking the most precar precarious positions or they don't have access to artistic careers at all. And this is obviously because compared to their privileged peers, they have um, they, they, can, they cannot afford the uncertainty, uh, unpaid assignments, um, long-term periods of inactivity, or even unemployment, something that comes sometimes with the artistic career. 
So it still remains to be seen and estimated how the pandemic has reinforced the existing inequalities within the sector, but it's already absolutely evident that uh, the most fragile players have been suffering the most. And um, why? Because funding schemes and hardship funds today are mostly directed to those who have been already um, visible in the scene. Uh, secondly, because digitization created access for some but reduced it for others. And for example, reopening strategies were not necessarily consulted with disabled artists. And there are many more factors which make it more difficult for the minority groups within the sector to be so-called resilient in these realities. And that's why uh, private and, and public funders should necessarily put this issue at the heart of the recovery strategies and funding programs of today and also post-pandemic world. Thank you, Elena. If you don't mind, we'll move on because we are already running a bit late, but we'll come back to you uh, afterwards with, uh, with um, other important uh, issues. Uh, we'll move to Derval now, uh, the Deputy General Secretary of the International Federation of Actors. Derval, um, you've been working on those issues for, for many, many years. What other features of the labor market, employment statutes, career paths, and working conditions of performers would you like to, to highlight today? Good morning, everyone, and, and good morning, Daphne, and thank you. Um, well, I think really um, it was very clear in the videos and also from previous speakers what it's like to work in this sector. But one thing that I think bears repeating is the fact that um, the artists, artists and cultural workers um, that we heard from this morning are generally very, very highly skilled workers. These are people who've invested in this career from a very, very young age, who've undertaken extended studies. And generally, I think work in the sector is characterized by an enormous love of the craft and an enormous identification with the craft. And uh, I, I think that was very clear in the pain um, that uh, was described by our dancer speaker this morning of trying to contemplate another career after dancing, because the identification with being a dancer is so very strong. And what this self-identification with the craft does, I think, is create um, a sector where competition kind of has no bottom because the people that are there are so dedicated to uh, what they do and want to do it so badly that they actually accept um, low paid, underpaid, and even unpaid work in order to try and build a career. And uh, many of them, as Ulrika mentioned, will also have a second job to self-subsidize their own work. So we don't have an idealized labor market in the sector where supply follows demand. And because of that, I think um, there's an even stronger need to be able to set a minimum floor. A lot of the um, speakers in the first video session this morning also mentioned uh, the kind of safe haven of having a contract. Several of them made reference to the fact that it allowed you to kind of take a breath, put down roots, think about other things um, and build an income around it as well. And uh, I think that um, there is definitely a need um, to have that kind of base for workers in the sector. Um, I think in reality, a lot of the time, the freelance workforce of the sector uh, who tend to be self-employed um, are actually also um, kind of self-penalizing by uh, accepting to use the fiscal advantage of being self-employed to actually stay in the sector and to accept that they are not able, like other workers, to um, have the insurances, the social coverage and the benefits um, and the access to training, et cetera, that, that should be associated with, with the work that they do. So um, I think those are some of the key aspects, really, of the labour market in the sector. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, which minimum standards um, for work in the sector do you think should be adopted and how do you think we could get there, especially now in, in terms of crisis? Well, I think, as I said, that there just has to be um, a minimum floor, really, for working mm -hmm. conditions. There'll always be the surplus of talent that Morton mentioned. There'll be more talented workers than there are professional opportunities. But people that do um, manage to break into the sector should be able to have a decent income. And by that, I mean that they ought to be able to live from their craft, from the work that they do. They ought to have the opportunity to hone their skills and to be able to develop a career. And um, being able to do that is really uh, the right basis for a thriving sector. And as a, speaking as a trade union speaker, I believe that the right tool for that is, is collective bargaining. Um, 
there's there's quite a strong tradition of of collective bargaining in the sector in Europe, um, perhaps partly because uh, formerly a lot of the work would have been done in longer term em employment contracts. But I also think it has to do with this identification with the craft. Um, and I think that social partners working together are <clears throat> are the right uh, actors really to um, advocate jointly for the sector, for adequate funding, for better, better social security systems, and to um, arrive at the right minimum standards uh, in, in social dialogue. Thank you, Derville. I had a question for you uh, related to the digital environment, but I'll keep it for later. Um, we'll come back to that in, in the in the last session. But but thank you. I'll I'll move to Barbara now. Hello, hello, Barbara. Um, hello. You work for the European Commission. Uh, you work in the Director General for Education and Culture in the Cultural Policy Unit. Um, thank you also for for joining us today. Um, if I'm not wrong, you have a forthcoming report uh, on the working conditions of artists that's about to be published. Uh, can you tell us um, a, a few words about it and can you give us some highlights of that report? Yes, well, first of all, to say that uh, uh, the, the work plan for culture, which the Council did, uh, already foresaw doing such a study on working conditions of artists when they did this plan and also meetings with civil society, member states, then also now the parliament did um, a resolution. So uh, I think you can say that even before COVID, people were gaining uh, knowledge and, and you know, understanding the, the, that the problem is really huge. Now with COVID, it's even, it's even worse as we have seen. So, uh, so I'm really glad that now we are we have some more data and comparisons of uh, looking at, at working conditions for artists, not only in the performing sector, but also in other sectors. So the new study, which will be published, looks at the characteristics of employment of artists, uh, the international and European framework, uh, the artist status and entitlements, and also interesting, uh, interesting issues on minimum wage and basic income, because basic in income actually may be an interesting way to, to choose. Because now with COVID, the un unemployment systems are quite overloaded. Now, uh, also the, the, the new study looks at social security taxation, VAT, all kinds of very incredibly detailed issues, very complicated. Then also it gives an overview of measures to support self-employed artists and cultural and creative professionals. In general, I, I have to say that this study relies heavily on the networks which are participating in this panel. Uh, so IETM, um, Culture Action Europe, Pearl, uh, On The Move, uh, Free Muse, because the study actually also looks at freedom, artistic freedom, which, is, uh, which has been mentioned already this morning. So uh, yes, this study heavily relies on, uh, on, on European networks. And I think also that's a new way of working that actually um, cultural and creative sector professionals, networks, policymakers, e the parliament, uh, member states, that we are switching to a different mode of working together. It's not like in the old days where the labor unions uh, had to, to climb the barricades and attack and the other ones would attack. So now it's more, we're more in a different environment where we have to face problems together and we start to co-create solutions. So that's very good. It's necessary because the, the context is quite complicated as has been mentioning before we are here in an environment which is not EU competence. So you, the EU has no competences to, to do social legislation or tax legislation. So this is why we need to co-create and to work together because member states have a lot of competences in, in this area. And which is why also very important to have here today with us in the next session representatives from the member states who have actually given the impetus uh, for the, the council to look at that. So again, to come back to what, are, what, what is, uh, what is uh, this study doing? Well, it has been mentioned also before that some countries have an artist statute, others don't. Is it better? Is it worse? It's complicated to, to evaluate what is better and worse. But um, like 
here you can then read that the artists, the countries which have an artist status like uh, France or Belgium, they focus on uh, performing artists and, and on the unemployment benefit side in case of non-performance. So some people also called it, it's an unemployment statute more than an artist statute. Whereas in other countries, they're more focusing on the mandatory social security contributions of the self-employed, which can also be a huge problem. I mean, there are visual artists or others having to declare personal bankruptcy because they are unable to pay the social security contributions. So in, in this context, it's difficult to say what, is, what system is, is the best. And this is why we need to, to work together to look at more in detail uh, you know, what we can learn from. Also the experiences with minimal wage in some countries. Is it really in a system that we are now in a crisis, is it really more expensive? Then to go through the administrative burden of verifying, paying, not paying, paying parts, you know. So I think it, it needs to be looked at in a fresh way. Um, there is a momentum. So we have the momentum of the COVID crisis, which can also be an opportunity in the sense that uh, conditions are really bad with people not being able to perform at all. Uh, so there, are, in that sense, a solution has to be found, and I think uh, everyone is aware of it. Another uh, momentum, sorry to say, is Brexit, because social legislation at EU level has been always more difficult. Now it is being deblocked. So my colleagues in DG Employment, they are now quite active. They have been forwarding new legislation proposals on minimum wages on conditions of the platform workers, on freelancers, Digital Services Act also looks at that. So there might be also some opportunity there. And then the European Parliament, of course, it's, it's a strong ally and I'm very glad that the MEPs will be there in the next session to look at the European framework for working conditions for artists, how, how we can go about this. One last word, because I think we're running late, is to say that all of these issues now today, yes, because people, of course, you're all of you are very uh, impatient because you have to to live. <laughs> That's clear. I mean, you, you cannot wait until all this happens. I understand. In so we need to have uh, different different uh, you know goals at this problem. One of it is that the Commission has already dispersed uh, lots of money, hundred billion, two hundred billion on the, uh, you know, so different different initiatives like uh, sure the unemployment benefits, uh, Corona response investment initiative, the guarantee fund. Of course, when you go to your unemployment office, to your local one, and you get your check, you don't often don't know that some of it comes from the EU because you know it's paid out by the local authorities so that's also another distortion we have to live with that EU money is often not visible so in parallel to the direct uh, COVID aid packages I think we have to to pursue this way of uh, which takes a bit longer to find a longer term solution for artists and creative professionals there will be next, uh, you know, next year, early next year, there will be a Voices of Culture dialogue with civil society, a big dialogue on uh, taking as a basis this and other reports and to, to suggest what has to be done. And I really hope that you will be participating in this Voices of Culture dialogue. There will be calls to participate early next year. And then in the second half of next year, we are working together with member states hopefully with ministries of culture and together with ministries of employment, because ministries of employment, we need them because it's so complicated, this landscape, and maybe also some tax authorities would be needed to, uh, to hammer out best practices, to see what is, what is really happening and where we should go. Uh, yes, so there's um, a heavy schedule ahead of us and um, we hope together we can, we can reach something. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. I think you opened a lot of avenues and I think it's very encouraging. We're looking forward to, to, to seeing the report and being able to use it also in, in, in our work. Um, we have just a few minutes left um, be, before the, the break, but there will be another um, Q&A uh, time uh, afterwards. So let's not be frustrated that uh, the session is not over yet. Um, there was one question in the Q&A that was answered uh, by Elena already, a question 
from uh, Goran asking um, whether we have any idea of, uh, of people already considering changing profession or that have done it already. And um, Elena said we, we don't have data yet, but yes, it's a trend that we are observing. Um, there is another question uh, coming from uh, Marina Maleni. Um, uh, asking whether also there is a work that's been done in the different uh, countries of listening uh, to the, the artist voices and, and recording their current situation and, and passing the message to, to the government. So I believe um, the organizations that are here today, they're doing that exactly. It's the, the study that Ulrike has mentioned and, and it's been done. Of course, it's very challenging, um, as Barbara said, to react to a uh, situation that's happening now, and I think everyone is trying to to grappling with that. But uh, but um, I think there is a need for that to continue further, and and it's clearly identified here. And then we had also another question, on top of everything else, about Brexit and uh, about uh, the British artists and you know their opportunities to continue working in the EU. Um, in the coming months and years. I don't know if anyone wants to, to say a word about that before we, we break yeah, just, for a few minutes. A word, just a small word on, on Brexit. We, the EU needs to wait for the UK if they would like to participate in Creative Europe, in Horizon, in the different programs. So, because of course, you know, they have to want because, uh, mm -hmm. yes. The agreement has to be reached with the, the they British have to government. Ask for it. They have to want to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of uncertainties still there, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, adding to, to the uncertainties. I don't know if any of the speakers want to say a brief word or if we keep it for the, the next session and we take Ulrike, yes, please go on. Okay, um, yes, thank you. I just want to address that, yes, in several countries now, uh, the politicians and not only the cultural, the, or the politicians responsible for culture, much more the mayors who are also uh, in the different cities, for example, responsible um, for funding artists and culture and so on. And also the usual public audience through the media is now very aware about the situation of the artists. And um, so the entire re reaction is like, oh, we did not know that artists were treated so badly. Um, and this also causes a little bit, I mean, a very, very good momentum. So to say, I mean, where now processes um, will start. And we have it, for example, um, in Bulgaria right now, that for the first time ever, um, there is now um, a coordinated process where uh, the ministry, the ministries are really directly talking with the responsibles or with the artists and uh, talking about social security and, uh, and funding structures, um, which are more sustainable and so on and so on. And uh, also in uh, Austria, for example, ne just next week, I mean, a big fair pay and fair play process, including all countries and including all of the associations for the, um, for, for the artist sector, so to say, um, will start. Which means, I mean, yes, there is a big, big awareness right now, uh, witnessing throughout Europe. And we really hope that all of these processes will uh, help now, as I said, I mean, to renovate the entire process, the entire system where all of the stakeholders are participating and will come out with new, uh, with new ideas, with new contracts, with new funding opportunities, and that it's not only to secure the unemployment uh, situation of artists, but uh, the focus must be very much I mean, to finance and to secure the working conditions for the artists and to keep them working not to finance the unemployment, not only to finance the unemployment situation, but really to focus on the, on the working uh, conditions for the, for the artists and to transfer the, these uh, structures. Thank you, Ulrike. There were uh, two more comments. Um, one from Stefan uh, Bermann in Germany uh, saying that uh, there is indeed no uh, reliable data, but uh, empirically that they also can confirm the impression that there is currently, at least in Germany, uh, um, an erosion of the system, and especially the self-employed um, are being uh, uh, becoming more and more fragile and, and having to, to change profession. He, he quotes 20% of the freelance artists that are facing a decision to stay or leave um, the sector. And then Heidi 
um, Wiley from the European Theatre Convention um, says that yes, in the UK indeed, it, it's actually the, the government um, that launched the debate of having artists change profession in a very controversial campaign that you might have heard of, of a, a dancer being uh, um, su suggesting that a dancer change careers and takes a job in cybersecurity. And then Anita uh, from uh, Pearl, Anita de Barre, um, who's uh, yeah, reminded that uh, Martens um, spoke about um, nearly 20% of, uh, of our professionals in Norway thinking of leaving the, the sector or change of career. So I think we have sufficient data to say it's really worrying and it should be faced like now. So thank you all. Uh, I suggest that we uh, take fi five minutes break now and uh, we continue the, the exchange and the discussion afterwards. So it's 11.34. Let's be back. I give you an additional minute at 11.40, please.
Welcome back. Um, thank you for still being there. Uh, we are now uh, entering the last um, session, um, the last roundtable of our session. Um, as mentioned before, earlier in the session, on the, on the 17th of September, the European, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on the cultural recovery of Europe. And it, in, in this resolution, it makes a number of very strong um, considerations and statements. First of all, uh, it, the Parliament uh, recognizes that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic crisis has highlighted the pre-existing vulnerabilities of the cultural and creative sectors and industries, including the, the precarious livelihoods of artists and cultural workers, as well as the, the tight budgets of many cultural institutions. The, the um, resolution also um, recognizes that the full consequences of the, of the crisis, um, um, the, the impact of this crisis on the cultural and creative sectors are just becoming apparent um, with the overall medium and long-term impact still unknown. Um, and that this affects, of course, the social rights of artists and of cultural professionals. Um, who have the right to be fairly financially compensated for their work and for the protection of a diversity of cultural expression. So all this quoting the parliament resolution and, um, and it calls on the commission and on the member states to take um, several actions. First of all, to, to earmark for the culturally creative sectors and industries, at least 2% of the recovery and resilience facility dedicated to the recovery. It, uh, it uh, criticizes the fact that the Creative Europe did not receive any additional funding uh, from the next generation EU fund and it calls for the overall budget uh, to be increased to 2.8 billion. And, uh, and then it notes with concern that the social safety nets were often inaccessible to creative professionals in non-standard forms of employment and it calls on the member states to ensure access to social benefits for all creative professionals, including those in non-standard form of employment. And, uh, and finally, it also calls on the, on the commission to introduce a European framework for working conditions in the cultural and creative sectors and industries at EU level, which would reflect the specificities of the sector and would introduce guidelines and principles with a view to improving working conditions, paying particular attention to transnational employment. So I believe this is very much uh, in phase with uh, what was said in the, in the previous roundtable. It acknowledges the specificities of the sector, its fragilities, the precariousness of uh, most uh, professionals, artists and professionals, the great impact of the crisis on the professionals and the cultural institutions. And it opens an interesting path uh, of uh, thinking about this possible European framework for working conditions. Um, but of course, this is still very first steps. It is a parliament resolution, but we thought we would, uh, it would be a great opportunity for us to actually open the debate and discuss what such a European framework uh, for working conditions in the cultural and creative sector could look like, what it would, could cover. And, uh, and to do that, we have the chance, as it was mentioned before, to have with us uh, two members of the European Parliament, um, Mr. Domenic Ruiz de Vesa from Spain, member of the group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, as well as Mr. Nikla Ninas from Germany, member of the group of the Greens, European Free Alliance. So thank you to the two of them for being with us today. Um, once again, please uh, do send us your questions through, uh, through this discussion using the Q&A box, if possible, rather than the chat, because sometimes the questions get lost in the, in the chat, but um, we'll manage if you do. Um, and in the live stream, you can also put them the, the questions uh, in the chat and they will be sent our direction. So, um, Mr. Who is Devesa? Thank you so much for being with us. Um, we wanted to ask you, what's your take on this uh, European framework for working conditions in the cultural and creative sector and industries? And how would you envision it? What would you suggest? How would you feel 
that ID. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, opportunity um, of uh, being with you today in your important event in order to uh, discuss a very important topic that is very close to, to, our, to our hearts, I'm sure, which is uh, precisely the, the point you were raising, the, the uh, developing a European framework for working conditions in the cultural and creative sectors. Uh, now, uh, we know that uh, artists and performers and um, everyone connected to the cultural sector uh, typically suffer from uh, rather precarious livelihoods, li li livelihoods. But we are also cognizant that this has, of course, been greatly exacerbated by uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, it is obvious to all of us that uh, this sector is uh, our creative and cultural sector is probably the most affected because we, we thrive with audiences, with the public, uh, with physical presence in theaters, in cinemas, uh, in performance, in music concerts, of course, uh, visiting museums and whatnot. Um, and this is why uh, our group uh, pushed very hard for this resolution that you were mentioning before uh, specifically on the question of uh, uh, the recovery uh, of the cultural sector, and there are uh, good ideas. Uh, and in addition, we have uh, the opportunity to also uh, have a European intervention in the, quest in the general question of uh, working conditions. Um, this is why um, we have uh, we have uh, proposed um, as a starting point uh, an initiative report in the uh, Committee on Culture and Education in the European Parliament to deal precisely with, with this topic of uh, the working conditions. Um, we want to call on the Commission uh, using this report, is still to be drafted, of course, and approved, but the intention is to call on the Commission to introduce a European framework for working conditions in the cultural and creative sectors and industries at the EU level, which will reflect the specificities of the sector and will introduce guidelines and principles with a view to improving working conditions and also with particular attention to transnational um, employment. I have to say that political action at the European level in this field has been long overdue. Possibly uh, because uh, in part to the limited competences that as you know, unfortunately, the treaty gives uh, the European institutions uh, in terms of education and culture. Something by the way that we must address and I hope that you, the Forum of European Theatres and all the other you know, partners in the cultural sector will will support will engage i invite you to engage and to be part of our upcoming conference on the future of europe this is an interinstitutional conference uh, but we want to do this uh, conference with the participation of citizens and organized civil society that means you directly and we need you there because we have also the opportunity in the long term i will go back to the to the short term in a moment, but in the medium and long term, we need to revise uh, the role of uh, European policymaking in the field of culture. And uh, that requires uh, a rethink of the Treaty of Lisbon in, in the topic. So I, I'm, I'm sure that with your participation in, the, in this conference, we can, we can be able to make progress um, in this field too. Now, going back, to the to the short term i said before this is a this european framework is a long overdue uh, because uh, the european parliament had already uh, developed a position on the status of the artists in of the artists in 2007 so it's more than a decade ago and in the 13 years that have passed 
not only the issues reflected in that resolution have not been properly addressed in many instances, but often they have worsened. So apart from you know, de new developments that we have to tackle, I think of digitalization uh, is, is a whole new world uh, of, uh, compared to 2007. So we probably have also to update some of the points, but not only regarding the updates, but also regarding the lack of progress on some of the objectives that were uh, already envisioned at the time. No? And this is why uh, I said it before, it's very important that we, we develop this new position uh, originating from the CULT committee in the European uh, Parliament. Um, now, we still need, I, I hope we're going to be successful, uh, but this is an initiative of the CULT committee and we still have to navigate the internal machinery of the European Parliament and, and get approval by the conference of committee chairs. Sorry for the bureaucratic lingo at this early hour in the morning and uh, the conference of uh, presidents of the political groups. But the, the ball is rolling and we're confident that we will succeed. And then of course, uh, since we haven't started yet, this is also a good thing because we can start engaging with you as well now, very early on, so we can make sure that all your demands and points are well reflected in this in this uh, own initiative report of the European Parliament. Now, if you allow me, uh, I don't want to take too much time. I'm sure it's more important to have uh, questions and interaction, but just a few concrete points. I think um, of my vision for a possible EU framework for, for working conditions in the cultural and creative uh, sectors. The first point is that of the scope. I believe it must be, and probably I think you will agree, it must be as inclusive as possible, uh, tackling the, situations or the situation of artists as well as performers, but also as I hinted before, all those that make culture possible uh, let's think of sound engineers, costume uh, designers, stage managers, makeup uh, personnel, whatnot. Some of the issues that we have proposed that the report covers are the right to remuneration for artistic, cultural and creative practices. Uh, we believe that, uh, of course, uh, I belong to a progressive group and for us, uh, workers' rights in every sector at very close to, to, our, to our heart. So for us, uh, non-remunerated work should not be seen as an opportunity, quote unquote, for exposure. For us, work is work and should always be paid and well paid, decently paid. Then of course, uh, the right of freedom of association in relation to competition law. Probably this is also very close to the interest of this audience. Uh, self-employed workers who join forces to improve their working conditions should never be considered a carter plotting to distort competition. It is almost a joke that this situation has come up in the past and, and we, it's totally unacceptable and we should be very clear about it. And we know, by the way, that competition law falls clearly within the remit of EU competencies, but it should be applied uh, in a reasonable fashion and not in an robotic automatic application of by now clearly outdated neoliberal principles. Then how can we address intermittence in creative careers, particularly for the vast numbers, again, the self-employed cultural workers is, is an important focus for us, of course. So how do we build appropriate safety nets that give access to benefits in case of unemployment, accidents at work or sickness, and even, you know, what just happened now, you know, a systemic um, pandemic affecting all of us, but particularly um, the, the, the operators and the workers in the cultural and creative sectors. How do we facilitate access to retirement? Is there a need for a European mechanism to facilitate access to pensions when you had a highly mobile European career, which is typically the case of cultural uh, you know, creators and operators and workers. In the cultural field, um, um, sorry, I, uh, I, I missed something. 
Um, the, the digital shift offers incredible opportunities for creators, but we must make sure that the revenues derived from the digital works can support better the, li the livelihood of cultural workers. These will become more and more important, not only because of the pandemic, but in general. Uh, in, the cultural, in the cultural field, research and learning and creating are closely interconnected. Career development and upskilling is a must to sustain a professional career. Then we should look at how can we foster links between education and culture in EU programs and policies. Also, because something that is also very important uh, for us is that we believe that the cultural, um, the artists and the cultural workers are creators of citizenship, are creators of values. And thus we should recognize that they play an important role in society. And this should also be recognized at a higher level, even at the treaty level. Other issues at the stake are career sustainability for women. We know far too many women abandon their creative practice due to lack of support as freelancers, freelancers, for example, after uh, or during pregnancy and after giving birth. How do we incentivize a, a, a diverse cultural workforce that includes uh, that, you know, that is protective of women at, and that includes minorities? These are only some of the overarching issues that we have identified so, so far. So I am very eager to hear your proposals and do not hesitate to let me know if there are any other crucial issues we must consider. As I said, we want uh, to have your input in this import with what I believe is going to be an important report uh, on the working conditions of uh, cultural workers. We have already um, requested a study of the committee. So there will be a study first. Um, this is important because you know there is a lack of EU-wide information. And uh, we are just to end at the start of a road. It's true that the road ahead is still rather long. We need to have the study. We need to get the report approved, uh, meaning authorized and then approved and then uh, action by the commission, uh, but uh, the good thing is that we're meeting at the very, as I, said, as I said before, we're meeting at the very start of this road. So it it is very good so we can uh, walk uh, together this road in favor of very good, better and decent working conditions of culture of cultural workers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think it's very encouraging to hear that it's on the agenda, that the topic is being championed, and that also you cover so many already, you know, you plan to cover so many key issues that have been addressed already before by the different panelists and that you propose to, to work together. I'm pretty sure that all the organization behind the European Theatre Forum and this session, <clears throat> sorry, uh, will be glad to continue the discussion with you and to send you proposal afterwards. Um, so I'll turn to um, Mr. Niklas Ninas now. Um, thank you so much for being here too. I'd like to give you the floor so that you could also comment on this uh, proposal and uh, give us um, your view on, on, on what uh, European framework on working conditions for artists and cultural workers could look like. Thank you very much, and also very thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I'm actually honored to speak for the or at the European Theatre Forum, um, especially because I started um, with theatre. I used to be acting myself, and I um, had a play um, pro produced, um, and so this was a very interesting stage for my early years. Um, but then also when I when I looked into the future of what um, I want to do um, after school and after um, all this this time, I thought of, well, do I want to continue um, acting and do I want to become an actor, actually, um, or do I want to go into law? So those were the two possibilities. And um, in the end, the, the one sad motivator to go into law rather than into acting was basically the working conditions and the payment and the uncertainties that I know that a lot of people um, working in the performing arts have to struggle with. And I have to say, this was also a reason for me to say, well, I don't want to 
um, be be always in this this hard situation, this hard um, problems to always have to look for funding, always have to work um, for uh, for scraps, um, for doing a lot of work um, for a very little remuneration. And so I decided to go into law because it's just safer as uh, as we see, seem it in um, in society. Um, I'm very thankful that Dominic already spoke. He's also a member of our CCFG, which is a, um, a group that we founded um, with the uh, with a lot of different MEPs from the whole parliament because we wanted to tangle exactly these issues. Um, we wanted to go into um, the situation of the culture creators, um, and so that's why we, call, we we founded the Culture Creators Friendship Group. And um, um, Dominic has already mentioned it correctly. We have a little problem here at hand for the European um, situation, which is the limited competences of the European Union on the affairs of culture. Um, and that is right. It's right for him to call on the um, conference on the future of Europe, because um, this is a moment in which we can all talk about whether we need more competences for the EU, for example, in healthcare. Um, which the pandemic has shown, but also in culture, which also the pandemic has shown, as I see it. And we need to involve into this discussion to get more competences in here, because I believe that if we want to be truth to our motto, which is uh, united in diversity, then we need to support different cultures all around Europe. And therefore, we need to support those people who are making the culture, which are the creators and the performers. Um, however, we have as, as the European Union and as the parliament in particular, I believe also the, um, the big task to defend the EU Charter of Human Rights. And in the EU Charter of Human Rights, uh, we have in Article 13, the right and the freedom of the arts and the sciences. And I think that this freedom needs more than just plain statement of, yes, you can do whatever you want. Because artists and performers need to be able to live of their work, otherwise they cannot be free in their art. So therefore, we need a, a framework, either in a directive or better in a regulation on the European side, on the um, on, on this um, working conditions, but also on the social status of the um, artists and performers. Um, I'm happy that we are involved into it. We have really pressured the Commission to start uh, the study, to start the process. We are um, we are proposing to, to have uh, studies in the parliament as well, to have this initiative report. Um, there are discussions going on on how exactly we want to shape the, the process, but it's going and the interest is there in a lot of different groups. So it's uh, that's also good to see that the, that the issue has been raised, not just by, by single members, but also by, by a lot of uh, different groups and that it's a high priority uh, becoming for the cult committee. Um, and now for the for the points on that I'm fighting for or that that I think should be going into this um, this um, discussion as a whole. I think one of the main uh, first points that we need to ensure is the um, con uh, is the contract safety, um, because the, a lot of um, artists and performers are actually um, self-employed and therefore rely heavily on contracts that they make with um, with the studios or or the theaters. Um, and therefore, it's important that those uh, contracts are from the very start of your career are safe for you. Um, I think that we can enable these contracts to be uh, safer for the performers, for the solo um, self-employed people, because um, we can also see that a certain minimum wage can also be in, involved into this um, framework, because you are always in, on the receiving end if you are self-employed, um, being in a contract um, negotiation with a, a big company or a bigger uh, firm or a big theater or, or whatever. So you're always in the less fav favor position and therefore we need to strengthen this position uh, in particular and even think about minimum um, wages already there or minimum re uh, remunerations from the very start. Um, Another big point in my understanding is the social rights. Uh, and this is an issue that we have, um, we have several mem member states that have solved this issue more or less with different uh, models on how to ensure that um, uh, creators and artists and performers always have a um, so uh, social net in the background uh, that catches them. Um, but a lot of member states don't have this support. And we need a solution there that involves the states because it's not working without 
and we need a um, we need a um, a pension fund as well as a um, unemployment fund in which um, artists and performers can pay into and to ensure that um, they are uh, safe in cases of crisis. I think this crisis, like we see today, um, just has has shown in a particular hard way how difficult the structure of the culture and creative sector is. Um, it is not like uh, the, this crisis has for the first time ever shown us that, the, that it's not working. No, it was always difficult. It was always a hardship um, in the sector to survive in the social, uh, in the social aspect. But this crisis really just um, put, uh, pressured an, another uh, dent uh, into it and showed the whole world basically how hard the problems is, uh, how hard the problems are and how much we need to work on it. And therefore, this is now really the time to go into the social status and the social rights of, work, uh, of workers in the, um, in the uh, culture and creative sector as a whole, and to ensure that they have a safety net to fall back on in cases of crisis, but also not just in case of pandemic, but also in personal crisis. What is if you cannot work anymore? If you are retired, how can it be that so many um, artists um, have a retirement of a few hundred euros and cannot really pay um, their rent for when their their um, pictures and, and their, their art is, is seen as um, national uh, symbolism of, of national culture. Um, it is a very big discre discrepancy that we have there in um, their art and their, um, their enumeration. Um, I have to look at my uh, page again, what I wrote there. Um, Oh yeah, the, the next point that I think we need to definitely talk about is the question of funding. I know that a lot of um, artists, especially those um, who are um, not under contract uh, or under continuous contract of big performing studios or, um, or theaters um, have always the tendency to go from one funding to another. They build up projects themselves, they apply for funding and they're doing so much for the community they live in. They bring people together and um, they do tremendous work there. However, these fundings are always hard to get by. It's always um, uncertain if they come back again, if the funding uh, continues. And also, and this is the main critique here, under which criteria these funding um, fundings will be paid off. And I think this is important to ensure that we have Europe-wide a level playing field for funding, that everybody has the same possibility to get towards the funding, that the funding is because freedom of the arts is not bound to certain rules like they do, for example, in Poland, where you can only get funding if you follow the rules of state government or God. And if your project doesn't have anything in common with that, you don't get any funding. That is not that should not be possible anywhere in the European Union. Um, your free your, your freedom of the arts should be protected also in the funding scheme. But also we need to ensure um, that uh, we, um, that not just big companies with big law, um, law firms in the background can apply for it because bureaucracy is so high. We need to ensure that everybody, um, also the small groups, theater groups, um, the, the individuals can apply for the funding, be it national or European funding, in uh, which I'm, by the way, very happy that we, uh, that we have a compromise proposal for the MFF on the way uh, to increase the funding of Creative Europe by 600 million euros, bringing it to a total of 2.2 billion euros, which is a tremendous win for the European Parliament, I would say, um, and a good step for uh, for the for the Creative um, Europe program as a whole. But again, here is the problem: we need to ensure that it's easy to access, that people can actually access it and don't have to, the hard time to go to too much um, bureaucracy. Um, Thank you I so much, to, Niklas. I'll have to ask to, you to. Just wrap up I if want you to can. Finish. Yes, I want Thank to finish you. One last sentence because this is very important for me to, to bring back this, what I said in the beginning. Um, I think that artists are um, not just crazy people living the dream of stars and everything. They're very hardworking, decent people that are a very tremendous part of our society and that make our, the well being of our society so much better. And we should. Um, thank them for that and treat them with the respect that they deserve. And that means a uh, fair payment and good working condition. And I wish to work for a society in which future generations uh, of people like me can not decide because uh, between law and, uh, and theater, not because of the working conditions, but because of what they prefer to do in life 
and seen that both of them have a fair remuneration in the end. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to to have to to rush you. I think um, yeah, in your presentation and and the one before that. Um, we, we approach all the key issues and I can see in the comments and questions that the, the issue of the self-employed, the issue of the secure contracts, um, the issue of the, of the education and sensibilization, it touches not only a chord, it's like the heart of the, of the issue. And, um, and there is also a question about the principle of subsidiarity, of course, and how could a European mechanism be established even before we change the treaty, if we manage to change the treaty and get to, you know, reviewing the, the competence of the EU in the field of culture. I think, of course, those are all very uh, complicated issues that have been around for, for many, many years, but I think it's very um, um, good that we open the debate again. Um, if you agree, I will move to the next two speakers uh, first, and then hopefully we'll get time for questions. Uh, we, we are running late, but um, I don't know if you can uh, stay with us. You're very welcome to. If you, you have to leave, we of course understand, but um, um, if you can, it'd be great. We can have a, a short exchange after it, because we have with us now two representatives of member states. Um, we are very lucky to have uh, Hedemarie Melzidner from the um, um, just second from the Austri uh, Austrian uh, permanent representation in Brussels, sorry, and uh, Catherine Tinpont from the Belgian uh, representation uh, in Brussels. Um, we're glad to be to have you here because, of course, there is the subsidiarity principles, there is the important competence of the member states in all those issues, and it's uh, very good for us to hear your take on this debate and uh, how you understand the added value of uh, uh, EU action uh, in the, on the topic of the working condition of artists and professional workers, and how do you think we could encourage action between member states and in member states uh, on the topic, especially in the member states that have less in place already, uh, less safety nets uh, in place uh, to support uh, the, the artists and the, and the cultural professionals. We are running late, so I'm really sorry. It's always like that when you come late in a session, but if I can ask you to, to, to stay yeah, short. Yeah, I will, I will do my best. I will do my thank best. You. Also, hello to everybody and thank you for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to take part in this uh, essential discussions. From a council and member states perspective, I, I can briefly, very briefly refer also to the context of this topic and what is planned at the EU, at the EU level. And then I will also uh, talk about the recently launched initiative at the, at the national level. It was already mentioned, there is a limited competence, but nevertheless, there are possibilities from, from the institutional sides and uh, also at the European level, we have to be in mind that not only the cultural competences are limited, there are also the social and employment uh, 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 limit, uh, policy, uh, policies, it, it, it's, it's limited, uh, consisting mainly of cooperation and coordination, but without any possibility of harmonization. What is also important is that uh, the role of culture and uh, the role of cultural professionals and artists are well recognized uh, in the, over the past years and gets more and more attention also at the European level. Uh, with regard to the current situation, um, uh, there are also a lot of positive effects of uh, mainstreaming, of cultural mainstreaming, which helps now and culture is present in many other, in many programs and uh, can get funding from there. Uh, when it comes now to employment and to income issue, then it gets, of course, tricky. It was also very well explained already by previous speakers that's char characterized by a complex composition of incomes. And I would say that the employment situation is quite particular and unique. There are short-term contracts and part-time jobs and uh, uh, very often it's a combination of self-employment with temporary or partial unemployment and jungle between different legal status, which makes the situation to come up with uh, measures quite uh, challenging. Um, the COVID crisis, it was also mentioned, of course, has an immense impact on the cultural sector. 
and uh, the, it has been well recognized that immediate help and assistance uh, had to be uh, developed and uh, there is a great variety now of emergency measures, general and specific support uh, initiatives and uh, it this has been implemented as well at the member states level, regional and local level, as well as EU level. And um, one of the most uh, pressing challenges, I think, is the persisting uncertainty uh, for everybody. I mean, it's not only for the sectors, for the artists. Unfortunately, it's also for the policymakers. And uh, please be in mind that we are all, we are very eager to help. And uh, uh, I know how, how hard we are working and we, how we find solutions, but the situation is quite unique and challenging for the policy level as well. Uh, concerning the member states, it has been already mentioned that we uh, define our priorities uh, for, uh, through multi-annual work plans. And these work plans are established as a strategic and dynamic instrument of cultural cooperation. So we define priorities. The last work plan was uh, developed under the Austrian presidency in the second half of um, of 2018, an important basis for this was, of course, uh, the new European agenda for culture. You are very familiar with the three strategic um, uh, priorities. And uh, so we define six uh, priorities. And um, one of them was uh, to focus on an ecosystem supporting artists, cultural and creative professionals and the European content. And with this, within that priority, one essential topic is to improve the working condition for artists and cultural and creative professionals. It's exactly the topic uh, we are talking today. It has all been mentioned by uh, Barbara that, uh, we are the, that there are different working mode, uh, methods to implement these uh, topics. And one will be an, uh, the, OM, the open method of coordination so there will be an, uh, an, uh, an, uh, an OMC group, uh, which provides a framework of cooperation between member states countries. It may be, be described as a form of soft law. It's a form of intergovernmental policy making and does not result in binding measures. And it's primarily based on jointly identifying uh, objectives to be achieved, which is, um, very important in this case. And of course, the exchange of best practice. The OMC starts on the basis of the study, which has been already mentioned. So we are waiting for, for this uh, uh, study. We have also heard from the European Parliament. So a lot of uh, essential work is in the pipeline and we are waiting for this. Then the stakeholders will uh, get together and uh, this OMC group will hopefully start in the second half of next year, so it takes a little bit time. And um, I know the, the all the issues are really burning and are demanding for solutions. At the national level, it has also been already been mentioned, one of the priorities is, uh, in the, is also to improve working condition for artists and the cultural and creative professionals. Recently, the responsible secretary of state uh, um, uh, did set up a uh, task force and um, a meeting took place yesterday already with her counterparts on the, on the regional level. And uh, it's it called a fairness process. And so they will come up with uh, the solutions and really to improve the situation of individual artists, so the working conditions and think about uh, social protections and social security schemes. So yesterday was the first essential meeting, but uh, in the course of this month, there should also be another meeting with the stakeholders and with uh, representatives from the, from the sector itself. And in spring, there will be hopefully first, uh, first results and before summer, a bigger conference is, um, is expected. Uh, to take place. And um, 
Maybe I can also mention that on the 1st of uh, December, there will be the, count, the, the, the Council of Cultural Ministers and the policy debate will be devoted to the COVID uh, um, impacts. And um, I think it's also a good opportunity to highlight this essential topic which is discussed today. And uh, what we should also have in mind that uh, since there is this limited competence that we have to learn from each other and there that we should go on with dialogue. And today's meeting is very essential and to come together and I appreciate a lot what I have heard from the sector itself uh, in, the, in the first panel. So I see also the COVID crisis, it might be a window of opportunity and it could be really the right moment to explore the possibilities for an EU action and hopefully we can contribute to it and uh, to the benefit of the artists. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for outlining all those other opportunities to, to push, push the topic. Um, between member states in the context of the OMC and others. Catherine, how is uh, the, how are you um, navigating those issues and what's on your agenda? Thank you, Daphne. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this very interesting conference, I have to say, uh, very inspiring. Um, it's difficult to be <laughs> at the end of the session because a lot of things have been said and uh, all, all very uh, true. <laughs> things so the the scene has been set to be in the theater mode um i can maybe elaborate a bit on what heidi was um saying we are in the same meeting heidi and me we are discussing from our in, in representing our member states and discussing on a member state level what can be done within the council of the eu um we are have have the main context that is the work plan that was mentioned before and then this omc that will start next year um, the working conditions so what happens in the omc is that we uh, as a member state uh, have representatives in a group that is uh, facilitated by the european commission and that will exchange uh, knowledge and good practices around these teams um, this is very important because the competence is on the member state level and this is where a lot of um, issues can already be tackled. We don't need to change the treaty. Um, we will not be changing the treaty next year, I believe. So uh, we, must, we must act where the uh, action is, is possible today. Um, so in the OMC group, uh, member state experts, and these are often civil servants that are close to policy making, that, that are close to governments, uh, will exchange um, how they deal with uh, issues in their member state. And um, this is a process that is meant to uh, be inspiring others uh, and, and trying to share knowledge, um, which is to our experience, because there has been a lot of OMCs in the past years uh, on different themes, and it is something that is really working and, and helping our policy development on a national level. So what are we doing today in, in Belgium and in the Flemish government that, that I'm representing also? Um, it was mentioned before we have had uh, an artist status uh, for about 20 years now, um, and it is a mechanism that um, is there for individual artists and also technicians, and that is um, um, giving a preferential access to unemployment benefits between projects. Um, so this is the basic idea. It is um, providing a, a more stable income for the um, uh, precarious situations uh, of, of artists. And um, we have been doing a lot of fine tuning of the concept in the past years and, and the COVID crisis unfortunately shows us that an, even more fine tuning is needed. And, and not, not only on this artist status, but uh, on a broader um, level that, that we would like to call fair practice. Um, fair practice is more than fair pay. It is also gender equality. It is also fair contracts, fair working conditions uh, on, on many different aspects. So this is the, the policy work that we are trying to 
to do in the next months and years, um, building fair practice for artists and, and cultural professionals professionals and the OMC exchanges will feed into this uh, thinking and, and policy thinking. Then maybe a last um, issue that, that I would like to mention here is something that we have been working on uh, in the past years. It is called Kulturloket. It is an independent organization uh, funded by the Flemish government and it informs trains and consults individual cultural professionals uh, in developing their careers and optimizing their social and legal status and their working conditions so it, this is we believe this is also very needed uh, as a tool for artists we don't we don't want artists to be accountants accountants or lawyers themselves we are trying to support them in, in these uh, matters through this organization. So this organization is there for them to help them in, um, in, in improving their working conditions. And maybe this is um, yeah, my last <laughs> uh, note. Thank you. Thank you. It is always difficult to come last as the last speaker after so much had been said, but you, you managed to bring new new um, options and opportunities and new ideas on the table. So it, it's really great. We are reaching the end of the session, unfortunately, and it's really frustrating because we have such amazing people around the table coming from different perspectives. We have the chance to have the parliament, the commission, the member states, the sector with us. So I wish we could continue for another hour, but we can't. Because also, as you know, there is a reporting back session in 15 minutes where the, the three parallel um, session will, will come back and discuss. And I've been told that there will be a Q&A opportunity there. So I would offer to um, not go over our time here, <laughs> we have two minutes, but uh, eventually to invite you to join that session at 12.45 uh, uh, if you have any pressing issue or comments or contributions uh, you would like to make. Um, I, will, I will also uh, want to say that um, I think we heard the invitations from uh, uh, the members of the European Parliament and from the member states to uh, continue the dialogue with them, to uh, send them any information, uh, feedback we can collect from the ground, voices of artists, testimonies, um, data, if there is any about the impact of the crisis on the sector, the urgent needs. So uh, I would invite all of us uh, to continue to keep the connection and continue working on that because it is a pressing issue, but it is also a long overdue topic as we all agreed um, at European level. And I think it's, it's about time that we really get together and work uh, on that together. So, um, yeah, sorry, yes. just one, one very short comment, uh, if I may, because I, I have to admit I was a bit disappointed uh, hearing the representative of the Flemish government, and I hope that doesn't reflect uh, the position of the federal Belgian government that has been always in favor of advancing European integration, including by treaty change. It's, it's really a pity that uh, she opposes uh, treaty change at this stage. It's something that we need at all levels in terms of empowering citizens and the European Parliament. And of course, also to raise the profile of culture and cultural workers in the treaty itself. We need to have the European pillar of social rights in the treaty. This will be hugely, uh, uh, extremely helpful to cultural workers. Of course, we will continue working in the short term with uh, the European framework of working conditions. But of course, we're going to change the treaty very soon because next year we have the conference on the future of Europe. And from the conference, we will have the springboard uh, shortly afterwards for, for changing the treaty. So I, I really hope that doesn't reflect the view of the, of the Belgian federal government, always very pro-European and in favor of a more united Europe. Thank you. Yes, Catherine, Can I, you want yeah, to first? Uh, yeah, just a very short reaction. Uh, I, I, I believe I was misunderstood because I wanted to send a positive message, which is that we don't need to change the treaty. Um, we need, we need, we need to do it. We need to do no, it. No, we don't. 
Well, we, we, we might need to change, but we don't need to change the treaty in order to act and to do something. So I, it was a positive message. It was a message that we, uh, we, we need can, the two things. We can the two things. act now. Okay, I think but yeah. We will not change it <laughs> soon. So we need action sooner, then we can change the treatment, treaty. Uh, and I'm very sorry if I was misunderstood. It wasn't a political message I was trying to, to make. It was a, a positive action, call to action. So I'm let, sorry let, if I was misunderstood. Now let's work on all fronts open to us and uh, and let's uh, create partnerships when we can and let's meet again in uh, 15 minutes i just had one more comment to make for the forum guest list participants who are currently with us on the forum platform you are welcome also there is another opportunity to continue the discussion in the platform room called the ringing loft uh, there you have an opportunity to meet, meet and talk face to face about uh, this topic. Continue the discussion there in an online settings that I haven't visited yet, but I'm really curious. So let's meet there later if you can. Thank you again to all participants. It's a complex issue. It's a burning issue, uh, but we really, really um, thank you for your presence and your contributions and your cooperation. And take care until soon. Bye bye. Thank you.